Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 309. I'm going to say hopefully it's 309. It should be 309. Welcome back to the show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How are you feeling? How are you doing? Good. I'm, ho- I'm glad you're all right. How am I? I'm pretty fine, I think. For the most part, all things considered, I've been dealing with everything pretty well. Um, I would describe myself as a little bit of an introvert anyway, so I tend to enjoy these moments of uh, enforced isolation but i have to say you know the last couple of weeks have been a bit tough don't get me wrong i think maybe the weather has a bit of a it plays a part in that you know you look out your window and it's a rare sunny afternoon in london and you're like fuck man i could be doing so much fun stuff outside but then you think to yourself hold on there's been countless other times where it's been sunny outside and haven't done jack shit so for me to suddenly realize or suddenly kind of come to the realization that I will be doing so much stuff if I was outside, you won't be doing anything. I think that most of us can understand that. If anything, this um, enforced lockdown has maybe allowed us, some of us, to kind of uh, focus in and on what we actually matters in our life day to day. Right, the things that we actually miss for real. Um, they're not the heady things I don't hear people talking about they miss going to Vegas and stuff usually everything people miss is like you know just the general everyday stuff right like the, the banter you have with your colleagues in the, in the kitchen at work or something um, the little communication you might have with somebody that you get your you know the, the news agents guy you get your oyster card top up from um, hanging out with your friends in the spoons or something people miss out on those things as opposed to the really you know outlandish um big events that people do to gather with their friends and i think there was a little bit of a you know don't get me wrong i think some of the social media posturing can get a bit annoying but in the last few years there was a bit too much you know concentration around you know people hanging out in big groups of big friendship groups going and traveling to these far-flung places and then posting about on social like look here's me and my friend here's me and my friends like cool we get it your friends but you could just do that anyway you don't need to go you know halfway across the world to show people that you're close friends and I think those kind of people the ones that like p- parade their friendships around are probably suffering the most but also I think they're also seeing the light they're also realizing that you know what um my friend is my friend regardless of you know what's going on in the world you just want to talk to your friend and hang out so once this lockdown is over I'm pretty sure we're going to see a different sort of um we're going to see different sort of recreational activities maybe some maybe you're going to see less um what, what do they call it uh is it experiential right experiential activities those kind of things where people go to like coachella and they go to like i don't know reading and leeds those kind of uh, glastonbury those kind of things where it just it's, just, it's like a it's like a social media checklist event right it's not necessarily something you go to because you love it it's more so you want people to know that you went to the thing that everyone has got FOMO over but i think now what we're gonna see on the other side is going to see people actually going to things that they actually enjoy with the people they actually love less hanging around with randoms um let's just wasting time in it because we've already you know by the time the stuff is over we might have missed out on six months of like social life right six months or so of like hanging out with people that we actually love and care about so there is no time to kind of you know hang around and do nonsense you might as well just take the opportunity of the time you have available and hang with the people that you love and love I would say anyway again this is coming from somebody that doesn't really care much for hanging out with people but i do think for people that you know are unlike me you should take this as a as a kind of wake-up call to really focus on the people you love and ignore the rest but again what do i know anyway in terms of like starting on a good note and just reminding ourselves on what we're actually missing out on i thought this video was very uh Brought, brought a tear to my eye, reminding me of the things that I want to do once lockdown is over. I've got some lists of, you know, I've got a little, little list of goals, a little list of um, things, not actions, not even goals, actions that I want to do as soon as everything's finished. And one of them is go to more live events or more, more live gigs, more gigs, more live, yeah, whatever. More gigs I want to go to, um, and this is part of it. This video here definitely reminds me of the reason why I want to go to more gigs. <laughs> In case you don't recognize that bass line, that's the Stone Roses playing I Wanna Be Adored at, what is it? I think that's Hamden Park, right? Um, in Scotland, live in 2017. Just hear people singing along to the bass line, how insane that is.
fucking bucket hats, all the kit being passed around, Mandy, I'm sure, jaw swinging, Stone Island everywhere, people wearing Adas gazelles, spitting on their friends, sitting on their friends' shoulders, running back from the toilet, pulling up their trousers, just absolute scenes, flares everywhere. <laughs> Imagine how how cool that would be to just be in that state. Like this is, again, you miss you know, you may, we miss a lot of things. But just these little events like this. Just imagine what you'd what, what would you give right now to be in this crowd? Fair enough, you can sit there and say I I don't like the Stone Roses. I don't care for this sort of music. You know what I mean? I don't wear Stone Island and hey, that's gazelles. All right, whatever. But still, what would you give just to be around this sort of environment where people are? you know, in love with the person that's on stage, right? Sharing in their joy. Cause that's part of the reason why festivals are pretty cool, right? Festivals get a bit of a bad rap from some people, but if you're really into bands and you know, indie music or music that's performed with a live instrumentation, sometimes going to a stage and having no idea who's playing, but then seeing, you know, hordes of people losing their mind over the person playing on stage makes you really happy. There's something about seeing other people um, excited over something that you have no idea what it's about but sounds pretty cool that makes you also equally as excited and you go away and like you know what I'm gonna just end this and then just later when I get back to the hotel or to my Airbnb and then suddenly now you become a fan of that band just because based on other people's energy so imagine what this would be like just standing in this arena hearing the Stone Roses belt out one of their most well-known tracks with a captive audience of people that are going absolutely nuts and again I'm not sure if they if this and if this was all snuck in the flares and stuff but the fact that there's not like a big announcement on the te on the tannoy on the telly screen telling people to like chill out and turn off the flares they're just allowing them to get loose and to get a bit crazy it's perfect <laughs> Pure joy. Anyway, I'll end it there because I don't know. I don't want to depress myself anymore. But that's one of the things on my list when everything's returned back to normal. A return to live shows because part of me thinks we're not going to see nightclubs back the way we expect them. What well, we're not going to see nightclubs. Uh, fully operational maybe until next year especially part and partly due to the news I've just got on the on the further topic that I'm going to talk about later on but we're not going to see clubs for a long long time so I think if you are looking for a hedonistic moment where you can go out and connect with your friends have a bit of a good time I think the best bet for you will be to go to a live gig or as I mentioned previously I think there's going to be quite a few promoters out there throwing these sort of like warehouse um illegal kind of raves in places because for sure if football clubs for the most part are not allowed i won't be allowed to like you know because i don't think football clubs would be allowed to to have fans in the stadium until a vaccine is found i would assume so because most of the insurers won't be uh, willing to you know be liable for that so until a vaccine is found we're not going to have any real live events over maybe 500 people i don't know maybe it might apply to clubs under for nightclubs under, under 500 capacity but for the most part it's going to be very difficult to maintain any kind of social distancing um, measures in a nightclub you know it's the opposite of a social distancing space isn't it so you're going to either have to go to a legal rave or you're going to have to fill your void of live events by going to but fill your void of going to a nightclub by going to a live event and seeing a band play and that would be pretty cool i think there might be more maybe we'll see a lot of djs turning into live acts and going that way um hopefully it's not just lazy stuff where they have a little npc machine they actually have an actual live show that they put together that'd be cool uh but yeah that's what i'm doing as soon as lockdown's over man i'm going back to the live gigs because i used to do that quite often before it was a thing but again it's difficult because usually for in, in my experience it usually it came about because i had somebody else that was willing to buy the ticket beforehand 
and then you would be kind of compelled to go and then by the time it comes around you're super happy they bought a ticket right you're super thankful but to make the plans ahead of time three four six months ahead of time to go to a gig it's a bit of a commitment um especially because you know london isn't the most spontaneous city in the world you might get locked into something things change i don't know just life in it just hard to make those kind of commitments so early on but I think considering the climate and considering what's going on in the world, it'll be probably it's a good what well, it's probably a good idea to maybe shift your perspective away from nightclubs and maybe go to a few more live events and maybe maybe there might be the there might be a loophole with the festivals because they are they're in like an open air arena. You can maybe you know maybe a, an event manager or a festival organizer can argue the fact that you know you can fit more people in the festival and have them spread out more. I don't know. But regardless, man, more live gigs for me. That's for sure. That's on the books. But anyway, let's get into some topics. Got lots of to talk about things I want to get through before we head off. Um, so a lot of places in Europe are gonna be easing the lockdown rules and and I'm still a bit confused as to why the UK is talking about easing lockdown because we haven't really done it that well. There's been many videos of people just, you know, on the streets in London, hanging out in parks and shit, which I don't have a problem with. I think the whole snitching, tattletale stuff with people in parks and stuff is a little bit ridiculous. You know, we're all human. We're all don't, no one wants to be indoors as long as we have been at the moment. We all want to be outside hanging out with our friends. So if people want to break the rules and do it, you, I think we can all understand why they're doing it. I think the, the kind of like, um, I don't know, the the faux indignation about it right people are like, oh my god i can't believe people are going outside it's a bit ridiculous you know why they're going out because you know they don't want to be indoors anymore they're fed up um we completely understand it but we're not doing it so i think we should cut them people a bit slack and stop snitching and recording people sitting in the park having a picnic just if it's not you carry on going in it go about your go about your life and keep it moving right? people need to kind of, people need to sort of mind their own business but i guess with social media it's literally impossible to do that but anyway regardless there's a conversation happening at the moment with you know people in government where they're suggesting that we're going to ease some of the rules in the uk which i don't really understand considering that we started lockdown later than italy spain and france and our lockdown was less draconian less severe than those places so why are we then going to come out of it this doesn't make any any sense to me whatsoever um but it is quite nice to see what's happening in italy people celebrating this video i think was from i'm gonna say it was about whoops. so from the guardian right let's re rewind that a bit it's actually me there altogether but it is from the guardian people celebrating out in italy on the streets because uh, the lockdown has been lifted um, and again this is what the, what the video says people dance in the streets in Milan as Italy lockdown began to lift on Monday and people were with their mask on which is pretty cool um, this is filmed from Facebook the music's too loud so I'm not going to play that out there but yeah I'm, I'm just interested to see what's going to happen when everything goes back to normal will people will people have PTSD and will, will they just stay indoors I think there was a there's a suggestion that people just go back to the normal I think everyone is talking a big game now about changing their ways and moving to different places but when push comes to shove they're just going to go back to their normal regular schedule programming which probably could be cool because you know like I said in the top of the program you might feel a different sense of appreciation for what you have but I don't know man especially considering how hard hit Italy is it's pretty cool to see them celebrating um, and having some kind of respite from it. this image from Venice people along the Venice canals clapping and cheering everything I mean, that's good and I'm, I'm actually i'm actually i'll be over the moon once we get out of lockdown we have to stop doing the whole clapping the nhs thing it's getting so ridiculous not that you know the nhs should be getting applauded they should just instead of getting applauded they should be getting more funding and they should get be they should get paid more but the whole um the whole virtue signaling of the clapping people recording themselves clapping people parading on twitter or facebook posts about them being disappointed in their area about people not coming out and clapping the shaming of you not clapping all this sort of nonsense is ridiculous what are you doing it for the clapping when you're clapping for the nhs are you doing it for them or are you doing it for yourself it's just absolutely like i don't understand that man the the, the, the worst of human nature has come out during the time and the best and i guess it happens in all crises right um, the best of us and the worst of us come to light and that is definitely an aspect that I will, will not miss um, like I said I'm sure the NHS would much rather they have more funding and they will get paid more as opposed to people standing and being you know, fucking saucepans and shit and standing one meter apart from each other it just doesn't make any sense 
but yeah um, it's cool to see Tony celebrating and they're out of it again I'm interested to see what happens in the UK it's an image of Rome people in the market sharing some drinks and stuff and hanging out with the face mask on um, again in the local cafes and stuff and I think that's the place most people are really anxious about right How, what is the high street going to look like your favourite bars and restaurants that you know and love will they still be there probably not right especially the ones that more likely than not because I think restaurants and bars are odd in that respect because a lot of them rely s- solely on just people passing by and popping in. Some of your most, some of the most busiest metropolitan bars and cafes that you know and love probably don't have Instagram pages or Facebook pages. Some, some of them, right? They just rely on people leaving reviews on Google, um, or on Yelp or on TripAdvisor. They don't do any kind of marketing whatsoever. So the moment they are uh, this sort of you know event happens and the uh, rug gets pulled out from their feet and they have no way of making money because no one's coming into their bar or restaurant suddenly st- starts shit starts to get really real really quickly and you s- it's i think it's a bit unfair in my opinion because i've you know i'm watching a lot of these chefs and restaurant owners on twitter kind of arguing but i do think it's quite unfair to ask these people who have gone about their business one way for so long you know, and even with social media, even with the internet, they haven't necessarily gone out of business to suddenly tell these people to hire a social media intern to get their business booming or to tell them to go on delivery and start sending out food uh, via couriers and shit, right? Something they've never done before because, you know, I think even from a layman's interpretation, I know not owning a bar or restaurant that the food that you'd cook if you had a delivery or Uber Eats menu is completely different than what you'd be serving in, in store to, you know, or, I mean, in the restaurant to your patrons. Um, you have to cook food that is can travel well, right? Stuff that's maybe easily easily understandable, you know, on a computer screen or, more, or a smartphone. Maybe it doesn't have to have too many ingredients. Whatever it may be, there's, a, there's, a, there's an actual science to it. You don't just get your menu that you have online and just, you know, post it up on Uber Eats app. It doesn't work that way. You have to have a kind of a tailor-made menu for that particular service. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean people are are they aware of your service. Usually when you go to Uber or delivery, are you trying to experiment with places or are you ordering at the same places that you order all the time? So there's a lot of things that go into it. So I I think it's a bit unfair to suggest that. And I think that's where the government meant to step in. The government's meant to come in and give them some sort of assistance to hold them over until things get back to normal. But I just think, you know, it's just it's a bit naive to think that the high street isn't going to change but it would be a real shame if the everything reopens and all we have is greg's pret manger fucking starbucks and costas around right they they never disappear but then all the little you know the little uh cafe that you go to on your lunch break to get uh to get a breakfast wrap is gone um the place that you went and met your boyfriend one time for dinner has disappeared the little place that you go get your your shirt steamed is done right but all the chains are still around that's going to be a real shame but let's see what happens in it but these this is the image of a bus in italy as well with some social distancing measures they've put paper across the chairs you're not meant to sit on to get some space i don't think it's going to work in the, in the uk can you imagine trying to do social distancing on another 25 bus from ilford to central london good luck it's in turin Selling in the main square. I'm not sure what they're doing here. But yeah, it's just, gonna, it's just an odd little existence. And it's going to last for a couple of months. But yeah, it's good to see people getting back to them. But again, I'm not... I am just don't understand why we are having this conversation. I don't see why we are the ones included in this. We haven't done that well in the social distancing measures. And we have some of the highest numbers in Europe. Now again, I think um, one of the politicians made a good point about, you know, we might have the highest numbers because we are actually reporting the numbers accurately or close enough to accurate. Whereas other countries are kind of fudging the numbers in order to not make themselves look bad. But Jesus Christ, man, you can't be having nearly 30,000 people passing away from this virus and suddenly be opening things up and, you know, announcing Greg's is going to open. It's just insane, really. But hey, what do I know? Anyway, let's move on. What else is going to be going on? Oh, so my, um, I saw this news right on Sky Sports News and I think it's concerning the Premier League football specifically, but I think this might have some sort of uh, it might feed into the stuff that's going to go on with nightclubs. Like I mentioned previously, and I mentioned it at nauseum, I still think we're not going to see clubs or nightclubs back for a while. I think there's still a lot of room. There's still a lot of room for 
back and forth debates with the government because already you know the governments don't really enjoy having nightclubs in their cities and shit right we're a bit of a scourge on them in general um they can't wait to shut some of them down they take away their licensing there's like a funding it's just a complete it's really it's a whole it's a horror show in it for the most part i think most um governors or not governors sorry most uh, mayors and stuff or people in parliament would much rather our cities be populated with you know cocktail bars and restaurants as opposed to nightclubs if they could get away with it but you know nightclubs do contribute to the night 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 time economy or night economy hence why the fucking 24 hour tubes were basically uh, put into place right was to facilitate that and we don't have many 24 hour clubs just completely backwards thinking anyway but i was thinking there's news now or some rumors going around that supposedly the premier league the football season next season it's going to have to be played behind closed doors because there's no vaccine. So they're saying unless they find a vaccine, supporters won't be allowed in stadiums. And that got me thinking, if supporters can't go in stadiums unless it's a vaccine, where, in what world can nightclubs open? Because nightclubs, for the most part, you know, the you know, most nightclubs are range between anywhere between 100 and, you know, 2,000, let's say, uh, capacity. And that's about the same size you would be to go to a stadium. Now, don't get me wrong, most Premier League stadiums are much bigger than that, but most football stadiums kind of operate in that bracket as well. So I would imagine if that's the case, we will see clubs back for a very, very long time. Um, but let's just quickly read some of the news that I, that I kind of got this from. This is from Sky Sports News. Um, the headline reads, Premier League clubs prepare for a possibility of the next season being played behind closed doors. So the Premier League clubs are preparing for the possibility of the whole season being played behind closed doors. While clubs discuss proposals to complete this season behind closed doors at neutral venues, they have also started to consider the impact of playing the next season without fans as well. Clubs are expecting football to get back to normal only when there is a coronavirus vaccine. Most experts believe a vaccine will not become available until the middle of next year. Which really makes you question what's going to happen with NACO, what's happen with festivals. Festivals, like I said, I can see a festival trying to find a loophole around the idea that it's in an open air environment, right? That it's not in a closed off area. It's not in a, underneath a, it's not in a closed arena. It's, you, you can basically leave as many points of, of entry and exit. So they could find a loophole around that. And, you know, there's obviously the, uh, the ability for independent promoters. Uh, to put on events in abandoned warehouses and forest raves and shit just to kind of fill that void but I think the idea of going and queuing outside a fold you know and making that amazing walk up the stairs and you know putting yourself in the lockers and going into the bar and having a dance I think that is way 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 off and the issue I have with it is you know fair enough if you want to be safe and the insurance the insurance companies don't want to be liable for it that's all well and good but this needs, there needs to be some direction or some assistance or some insight from the government as to how they are going to support nightclubs during these testing times, right? Because what you don't want is that when the economy reopens again, for there to be nothing around, then people are really going and partying at illegal raves. Especially the people that shouldn't be partying at illegal raves because, you know, the actual, there's a skilling going to an illegal house party or an illegal warehouse rave somewhere. There's, there's a way, you have to be street smart, you have to be knowledgeable of the area that you're in not everyone can go there you might put yourself in danger there might be questionable people there whatever right there's a lot of risk involved in it and you don't want your average regular regular joe going to those kind of places this is why we have you know legitimate clubs are basically there to service people who don't necessarily want to go and you know stand in uh, underneath some trees in the middle of hackney hackney uh, marshes and stuff right some people do want to go to a nightclub put their things in the cloakroom whatever it may be so you have to provide them with that space and if you just give these clubs no assistance and you let people just do their own thing what do you think is going to happen and it's going to be a complete horror show and then they're going to go and come down on the promoters for illegal events but you've effectively created this sort of like um uh, what you call it what sort of power vacuum you call it maybe a recreational vacuum right because you've support you've not offered the, none of these places support you've offered them no assistance and then other people try to step in to fill that void because everyone needs to let loose at the end of the week you then come down hard on them so I really, really liked. I would like to see again. This is just a story about the Premier League. This might not be an actual anything based on any kind of fact or evidence. But I would like to see the Premier League come out and make some sort of announcement about. Sorry, not Premier League. The government come out and make some sort of announcement about what they're trying to do with the night, like nighttime economy. What they're trying to do with the restaurant, with the restaurant industry. There needs to be some support given to these places, um, in order to kind of allow them to 
go through these hard times and kind of come out of the other side and be able to build their business back up because you know most of these people are going to feel like it's, it's a bit unfair that they're not being given a fair crack of the rip right that they're being left out to, on a lurch on their own you've not really heard much about government assistance apart from the furlough scheme but you know in terms of your actual business operators and owners what are they going to do but the article continues here, it says, um, in the meantime, many clubs believe one of the first things that they can do is budget for spending little or no more money on transfers when the next window opens, that's perfectly fine. The Premier League have said, uh, failing to finish the season would cost us 20 clubs more than £1 billion, bloody hell. But playing next season behind closed doors is likely to have an even more dramatic effect on club finances. Premier League clubs make the majority of their money from broadcasting income and apart from that their revenue stem mainly from match their income and commercial deals, which is probably the same with um, clubs anyway, right? They only make money when they're open. Um, both those revenue streams will be significantly reduced if the games are played behind closed doors. Which is probably why you're going to see a lot more clubs doing live stream events where maybe you pay, especially with Facebook's new feature at the moment where you can sort of like pay. Well, I think they're going to roll out a feature where you can have a live stream set up where you can pay for it, right? Because I think, um, who's doing it at the moment? I'm going to say, I forgot what it's that. It's that Sex Positive Party, Crossbreed. Is it Crossbreed or something, right? They're doing an event now at the moment where they have like a live Zoom party they live stream zoom party where i'm assuming they give out a private link to people that buy a ticket so you can join their zoom chat and then you can get freaky and ship so i can assume i would assume that if these services of these um, apps and stuff get a little bit more sophisticated and they implement some kind of you know monetary system or transactional system uh, infrastructure within the app sorry there isn't a possibility that you could you know have people buy a ticket or buy a pass to watch a stream um, from a nightclub or something right which is a bit naff don't get me wrong but that will be a way for them to make money for the club's end right and then they can maybe host different labels and stuff get people to pay for the operational cost of the day and you don't have to pay security i don't know there might be some way of making money that way but clubs really do need to put on nights and people coming in buying drinks and stuff in it and again maybe also i think it's something i've always thought about i thought i know a lot of people probably think it's naff but it might be an opportunity for some people to start selling merch at their events. I've always, you know, if I'm if my favorite DJ law is on a is on a label that I like, but I don't necessarily want to pay for the shirt to come from Zurich, or to come from Berlin, you know, and take f a week or whatever. But they're coming and playing at my favorite club. I will be up. I will be up for buying a T-shirt after a night of getting drunk and smashed after these gigs finish. Right? If you just bought a box along with some T-shirts and started selling them twenty quid each after the nice because most of those the big leaders are playing the closing set right if, if a Dax J had some shirts and you're selling at Corsica Studios would you buy one I would so maybe that's an opportunity for some of these guys to maybe start you know looking at other revenue streams apart from just producing music and playing because both of those things require kind of require you to be there right you need to make the the remix make the tune and you need to physically be somewhere to play but if you're able to make some kind of money from i don't know live streams of how to record a set or whatever it may be or merch whatever it just allows you to diversify your income somewhat and maybe clubs could also follow that model but the club i would assume mostly would be benefit it would be beneficial for just to open as normal but if this story is to be believed we're not going to see nightclubs back again until the middle of next year which again goes back to what i was thinking before and i kind of had the assumption that it's impossible that we're gonna have those insurers sign off on a club reopening without a vaccine inside because the moment one person gets ill especially somebody who's got the means to sue it's just going to be a whole complete nightmare for those people especially because most of those uh owners of clubs they usually or yeah most of the people that own the bigger clubs own a, a whole kind of slew of clubs so I would assume that lawsuit would just extend towards their whole network and just shut a business, just not worth the hassle really. And these people get paid those big bucks to make, you know, kind of really uh, calculate decisions on the kind of short term risk and long term gain. So sometimes maybe taking a bit of a hit in the beginning can maybe pay dividends in the end. But let's see what happens again. It's just a thing I read about the Premier League. It might not affect the clubs, but I don't think it's a. Again, maybe it might be an option to just go abroad and go somewhere else from a party, but. I think if you're UK based, you should be worried. You should be. Duh, duh, duh. Let's move on there. What else to say? My Berlin May Day tears. Yeah, this is a big one. So we were meant to go to Berlin last week and this week for the, for May Day's festivities. I've never actually been to Berlin during May Day. I've only been, you know, a couple of times during because I was quite unlucky. The, f the first few times I went to Berlin, I obviously went with friends and we went, you know, in January and December or some shit, right? So I think when you go to a place during, when you go to a 
for me, though, especially when you go on holiday someplace for the first time, you tend to usually stick to that date because you just remember how good it was. You just want to relive that event again. So for some reason, for the following two years, I kept going that same time, right? Then the first time I booked my ticket to go in the summer, I was like, the first thing that, that struck me when I went in the summer was like, bloody hell, it's a lot more expensive than it is going in January and February, right? Well, of course, because the summer's peak season, right? I didn't know that. I didn't know you had a season in Berlin. I just assumed it was the same all year round, right? Um, and of course, the weather is beautiful there during that time, right? It's incredibly sunny, incredibly warm. You could just essentially go out in like a shorts and a t-shirt all day, not like how it is in the UK where you have to carry a hoodie or a scarf. So um, I only started to enjoy the summers in Berlin the last couple of years. I'm not Most of my time there have always been in the winter. So when we booked the May Day gig, when we booked the May Day trip, sorry, to go for you know an extended trip, a week and a half, I was really look. I was really amped up. Even though I've been to Berlin a lot of times, I think going with a friend and going for the first time to May Day will just put a whole different slant on it, right? It's all street food. It's all open airs. It's all outside shit, right? It's just a whole different way of exploring and enjoying the city as opposed to maybe just going to a club and staying in there all night. You're gonna be walking around, going to record stores, village shopping, whatever, right? But it didn't happen, of course, because I think I might have actually gone to maybe maybe the last gigs or so in Bergheim, my one in March, might have been the last event that was there. And I, and I remember at the time when I came back, I did say it was quite empty. Um, I'm pretty sure I must have went to the last one. I'm pretty sure I went maybe one of the last ones. It was about March where uh, I forgot who was playing. Who was it? Nazaria and somebody else. Let me see. All months. The, 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 I think I, I went to the last one. I'm pretty sure, man. It was March, get up on the screen here, I'll show you, it was March, isn't it? Was it March or was it February? I think it was March. That it went, uh, let's see if I can it, Naz. Remember Naz really was playing. Okay, maybe it was, maybe it was February then. So I think I might have went just the, the month before it, it locked down, because I'm pretty sure Germany or Berlin locked down in about, um, yeah, that's when I went, yeah, I went to this one. That's the weekend I went, I went the last weekend of February. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. yeah, Saturday the 29th of this year. That's 10 man answer code Boris, Dr. Rubenstein, uh, DB Swan, Muscle Deep Winners, Rio Neil, and then Panorama Bar, Octa Octa, Aries Jew was fucking banging. Soundstream, of course, was good in time of summer, smashed it too. So that might have been one of the last ones. I remember it being a lot emptier than what I was used to it going a few times, but again, we we're meant to go back again during May Day. Imagine how amazing and fun that would have been. And to add insult to injury, right? It makes sense to me this flipping um, IG post from a DJ called Pirel, who I'm not really that familiar with. But she posted um, the other day that she would have been playing back to back on Friday with Dixon, one of my d favorite DJs in the world, right? They would have been playing back to back in Panorama Bar on a Friday. Just imagine how amazing that would have been to be there during that time. And that would have been a surprise. We wouldn't have known that, right? Because I'm sure it's something they would have probably never announced. It would have been like a special guest thing or something because I'm sure if they announced Dixon's name on the list, it would have just went completely bananas. But don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a bit bummed, but part of me is also like, you know, Friday is one of the hardest times to get in there. Um, in the Bergen, you know, it's, it's busy. From Usually a lot of the diehards try and get there on Friday and just stay the whole way through or get a stamp and then come back later. But most of the tourists also go on the Friday too because, you know, it, you better bang for your buck and if you leave after work, you can still have a drink, have something to eat and then go to the party later on. Um, but just imagine how great that would have been. I'm so gutted, man, that it didn't work out. I just I would have actually preferred not to have known this information, but, you know, it is what it is, man. That would have been so cool to see Dixon play. Uh, back to back with this girl in um in Bergheim, but hey, it wasn't to be. Um, but I'm sure a lot of people have had similar sort of stories and are booking tickets to go to IB for or to see a certain person or, you know, whatever other festival or deck mantle and stuff. You know, those people were probably guided as well. But tough, tough times. Um, tough. And again, who knows when we're gonna see those um, we're gonna see that entrance again, right? Like, just imagine what that's gonna be like the first right back there. I can already imagine what the streets are going to be like here. I'm sure people are going to be a bit crazy, even, you know, outside stations and stuff. There's going to be a lot more buskers, you know, doing their thing, playing stuff off and be off a fucking loudspeaker, of a, sorry, Bluetooth speaker. But just imagine what it's going to be like when everything reopens. Fold comes back in for the first night. Bergheim back for the first night. The school back for the first night. Yard back for the first night. Mix back for the first night. X or Y are back for the first night. Bloody hell, just imagine what they're going to be like. It's going to be madness, right? 
world unknown that party when they come back for the first night god damn hey what can you do let's move on what else is on the list here i want to talk about Bappity bappity ba. The mountain deadlifting 501 kilograms is amazing, but you know, there's no point even talking about it because it's not even within my purview of ability, is it? It's just a complete freak show of, a, of, a, of an achievement. Um, that's the thing I think, speaking about weights, so just in general, this is my, you know, my little weights ran compared to running. I'm pretty sure by the time the lockdown ends and we're back to normal, my strength is, you know, nowhere near where it was before. I think, but the, the the funny thing is that I think with weights as comparable to running, even though my strength isn't where it is prior to lockdown, I'm sure after a couple of weeks I'll get back to, a, you know, a fairly good level where I was before in terms of how I was able to pull, press and all that shit. Um, but I've found with running, if you take a couple of days off, if you take a week off, starting again is just brutal you feel like you want to you know you feel like your your balls are coming out from your ass the first mile or so is tiring um you just want to stop and then suddenly you hit your stride and you start to get momentum but you're still in pain and it only gets better the more you do it but the more you do it the more hurt you feel uh but with strength training ugh, you see so many incremental gains in the beginning especially if you've never done any sort of weightlifting just the, 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 I would love to go back to the beginning where you just, you know, you're lifting just the bar and you're working with really low weights, quote unquote girl weights, and then suddenly you start to develop a bit of strength and you make, you make such big leaps in your strength more so than you do in your endurance and you're running. You know, you hear people that run and sprint, they're trying to shave off a millimeter of a, uh, a quarter of a second, right? Why are they doing that? Because it's harder to make those um, big leaps when you're running because you usually hit a bit of ceiling or you, you, know, you might only have a certain level of endurance capability anyway or you know cardiovascular capability but strength there is really no ceiling and how far you can really go and how far you push up especially relative to where you start from um, that's the only thing that kind of annoys me about it I'm sure once I go back to the gym it's going to be an absolute horror show I'm going to have to pick up like you know the 8kg kettlebell and stuff and just keep moving around with that but it was pretty cool to see him this is the mountain from Game of Thrones what's his actual name uh, Hey hi, hi for Bjorg, Bjorgensen Hey for Bjorgensen the mountain from Game of Thrones he looks really jacked now even more jacked than he was in the Game of Thrones and he was breaking the world record that Eddie Hall uh, set, I'm pretty sure it's the one. And the funny thing about watching this is that he he pulls 501 kg, right? I think my max comparable is like, I don't know, 108 or something like that, right? Nowhere near where he is. But if you actually watch the footage of it, I'm just going to play in a minute, he, it, it looks really easy. It looks like if he wanted to, he could easily add a couple more kg to this, right? And set the bar up really high. He looks like he could clean maybe half of that weight really easily, right? Um, and he's got this weird technique or stance because I'm assuming how big he is where he's having to really stand really wide, sort of like in a sumo deadly position, bare feet of course, make sure he's gripping the ground. And then he's kind of picking up in a weird sumo deadlift sort of type position. But then you see, maybe it's because how tall he is and where his knees are, he kind of has to kind of give himself as much clearance as possible. Once that bar hits, hits his shin, he just stands up and pivots and it's if it looks effortless again maybe it's because you know he's strong as fuck and his arms are huge once he gets them above his shins it's just all arms to just kind of pull that back up again but he makes it look really really easy man i love the bit where his friends are kind of amping him up here as well i'm gonna play it <laughs> Look at that. Easy does it. Easy. Yeah. Amazing. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. 
it's so cool to see that that's another thing I'd want as well going for that's another sort of uh, post lockdown goal have some sort of garage gym where you're able to do some kind of weight training and strength training that's what I miss the most don't get me wrong running is good I've got a lot of pleasure from doing my little runs at the moment I'm currently following the Hal Higdon 5k plan and trying to average about 15 to 20 miles a week which is brutal but there's nothing like doing a bench press nothing like back squats nothing like deadlifting uh, power cleans overhead presses you know Turkish get ups like all that stuff is just ugh. and part of me also is a bit like there is an also a bit of a what do you call it there is a little bit of a root there's a bit of a ceremony around the idea of going to the gym getting my stuff ready preparing it in the morning making sure my water bottle is nice and filled up getting changed walking to the gym getting my you know make sure i've got the good stuff playing in my ears maybe a david goggins clip maybe some new album that dropped that's all part of the process so part of me was like you know oh yeah i can just do all that stuff at home but really it's not the same I, I quite enjoy having that separation you know having something to kind of quote unquote look forward to doing right because apart from the stuff that you do at home your kind of hobbies or the things that you're into you need to kind of give yourself a reason to go outside in it that might be because you're a friend might be because you're going to visit your partner or because you've got different family members all over the place but you have to give yourself a reason to get out of the house and part of the reason to get out of the house is maybe work you know uh, hobbies outside of outside of your house whether they be you go to a class or something Pilates or going to a gym so not having that at the moment is a bit of a mind fuck but again like I said that my kind of goal at the moment is just to keep that kind of routine make sure I'm running in the morning so I'm kind of going out and doing something which is not the same but you know I'm going to doing something along the kind of lines but yeah I miss pulling away I miss holding a barbell in my hand covered in chalk and shit Ugh. but hey what can you do what can you do that is him smashing that record there what else do we want to talk about before we move on do 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 yeah, this is an interesting one, isn't it? So TJ versus Ruby Rose. This is a weird one because if anything, if coming off the back of what's happened with the whole um, with the whole Duce Palooza crew and the stuff that's been going on with them, the allegations that have been swirling around the internet, this is another indication of just how um, strange... Uh, well, no, Duce is not a good example because those guys are older, right? But it's just interesting how um, different the this generation are when it comes to their public relationship or how they deal with the opposite sex or people that they're into right because this story follows this rapper from new york called teach little tj um, i'm guessing he's somebody up and will come up and this girl called ruby rose who's famous for dating playboy Carter in the past and also a rapper in her own right so i guess she's uh somebody that a lot of kids are into right she's a cute girl so i'm assuming guys are into her um and he's not becoming rapper I'm sure her DMs are on fire. So somehow along the journey, this little TJ guy ends up hooking up with this girl. And then from there, it just goes downhill. He ends up hooking up with her, uh, refuses to buy her flight home, which I'm not sure if that's a thing, or if that's the way they do things in America. If it is, fair enough. But it's just the whole aftermath of it was really nasty and really just petty and childish. Don't go wrong, they, he is 19. I'm sure she's maybe no older than 22 but um, it's just interesting to see how shitty some of them it's just there's a contrast right there's some guys like you know NBA young boy who's declaring that his wife his wife is screaming out of his top of his head right he's got the girls in the scene in the frenzy right they're willing to kill each other over him but you know he's fairly there's there's guys like him who kind of look like they like having girlfriends as opposed to like hooking up with randoms which from the outside of it I'm not sure sure but on the other side of the spectrum you've got guys like this who brag about how shitty they treat girls on social media and it really makes me wonder, like, what, number one, the girls see in those kind of dudes. And it also makes me think, is there, is it a good thing for the up-and-coming dude to have? Because I think if you're an up-and-coming dude and you have a slight bit of game and you can treat a girl nice, you should be able to sweep up pretty easily, especially within this kind of, like, American hip-hop community, right? Because for the most part, from what you see, again, we don't know how the these documentary not documentary but these reality tv show people or the people on the or the people that are out on the blog or the shade room we don't know how they kind of spin the narrative but from the looks of it it looks like the guys do a really do you know do really bad by the girls right they really treat them poorly and i guess because there's not many guys to choose from within that community they're just kind of circling or you know recycling the same dudes around each other they have to, and again if you're a girl that has a certain 
you know, lifestyle requirements, you know, you're probably not going to deal with a UPS dude. But Jesus, man, like, is this really worth it? Having your business be put out there and for everyone to see? It's just a bit nasty, isn't it? But this is the whole story. Anyway, this is from what? Um, UK drill news and says backstory she flew she flew to him he beat it and didn't want to pay to get her flight back and again it's weird it's a it's a, it's a childish thing because he's 19 and to really brag about something like this but I think it's also kind of um, maybe uh, an indication of just where some of these guys minds are right in it it's more so the goal of it wasn't to get with the girl it was more so just to have her as part of his collection right based on that famous future song right part of my like you know you're always going to be in my collection so maybe that's part of the kind of mindset that goes into this but let's play a bit of the video this is them hanging around but i'm assuming i'm talking what is this don't touch me please you don't touch me okay so are you going to give me a flight no what's wrong with the fuck you know yeah bro so there's no flight going on what's wrong so, and I said every time I get in a car accident the impact is slow motion for me yeah it's just again it's a bit of a non-story there's not much more to add to this apart from you know I think it transpired that he did actually pay for a flight back and it was an argument a misunderstanding she then went onto Instagram and showed her money and how much stuff and saying that she didn't want to spend her money and blah 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 but it's just interesting like I said the, in contrast with what's happened with the Duce Plus and stuff with just how shitty some of these guys treat girls and Especially I'll just, I don't know, I get the impression it's Leo TJ dude, part of his stick is that you're kind of a ladies man. Why wouldn't you just want to treat girls nice, you know? If that's part of your kind of, uh, your thing, your appeal is, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe he can argue and say, but NBA Youngboy doesn't treat ladies nice, but I don't know, I think he does. If the girls are that much into lady NBA Youngboy where they're willing to kill each other over him, I think, you know, behind closed doors, he's probably a bit of a gentleman. Um, he might be playing them for, you know, for fools but in general i think they probably have a good time hanging out with a dude but again i just i just don't get it man like i said with the dude's plus thing if you're a party that promotes yourself um you, you kind of lean into the idea that you're a safe haven for girls or that you know loads of bad bitches come to your event wouldn't you want to treat those said bad bitches really well and make sure that they bring more friends uh and they tell the other friends they just keep you know they keep the they keep your name hot in the streets right you want that kind of um you wouldn't want to be taking advantage of the people that attend your event week in week out because because you know what it reminds me of a little bit which is a, probably a bad comparison but it reminds me of why some people were really pissed off about what louis ck allegedly done to those girls right when he asked them to masturbate in front of them right because i think they were saying that it wasn't that he did it it was that he did it to people within his own community right like people his peers right girls are also coming up in the industry because they were put in a position where they felt as if like if they didn't allow him to do what he wanted to, you know to masturbate in front of them that it would maybe hamper their career now of course in louis defense he would say no I, he asks everybody that right he ducks it doesn't matter he ducks a fucking first lady if he could do it if, if it permitted um but i understand that kind of you know that tension of like oh you know this, this like sorry imagine in Duce Plusa case that guy is the person throwing the event and if he wants to slip his hand down my trousers should I just allow it because I want to get tickets for the next one it puts you in a weird a weird predicament and it's again it's it's more so on the dude's end to be more responsible and just not allow that stuff to happen and I would imagine too because again I've, I've only thrown parties back in the day and I didn't take advantage of any of the attention I had back then and I probably didn't have it anyway because you know I was just not aware of what was going on around me but when i support club night song you kind of wanted i think i was known at the time for like you know throwing away tickets and i mean drink tokens and giving them to random because i wanted them to come back you were kind of trying to be a people pleaser so if anything you were trying to do everything in your power to make people like you so they would keep coming back because you know by and large you know you know if you're a promoter and you do on the club night you're not that special really in it right anyone can do what you're doing so part of the reason why people should be coming back is because of you and the kind of vibe that you uh, are able to cultivate in a club because, you know, everyone's got a night. Everyone knows how to put a flyer together and put a lineup. It's not difficult, but it's the intangibles that are going to make people come back again. And, you know, maybe just having a room full of people that look after each other. And, you know, if a girl gets too wasted, no one's trying to kind of take advantage. People are just trying to, you know, get her an Uber or call her friend to come pick her up. And, like, just really nice kind of caring things that kind of go a long way to kind of, you know, 
show that you are a bit different than what's out there because you know the general every, I think most people most girls I think would expect to get nonsense attention from regular schmegular high street places they go to right because you know that's part and parcel of going to like an average joe you know middle of the road general population club but then once you go to a place where the music is sort of like you know catered to a certain demographic it attracts a certain type of people the people heading it are of a certain mindset you would think that the action will also be different in your regular club that you went to back in the day but when it isn't when it doesn't happen it doesn't match up it can be a bit disconcerting but like i said again i think with this issue with tj and little and the ruby rose i think if you're a young a rapper coming up and you've got a, a minuscule amount of game and you treat girls nice i think you'll do really well because if guys like him are able to get away with this then it means i don't know what it means man it just it, it probably looks bad on the girls too because it means that they're putting up with absolute dog shit of humans to you know because they just have to because in her defense too you know she's not gonna go for some dude that works at t-mobile she just isn't she maybe can say an interview and be nice and cute about it but she just it just doesn't make any sense they're not compatible right um they're not in the same world it doesn't make any sense whatsoever so i i, I have sympathy for her because she only has to she, she can only choose from people that work within the entertainment industry uh or the music industry um but you know she has to aim a bit higher than that man and again who knows there may be more to the story but it's just interesting to see how shitty some of these american dudes treat girls man it's just like wow 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 but let's continue on here what else we want to talk about before we head off do, 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 do. players heads tend to come back i thought that was interesting you know mask firing shots LMAO, what's this? Rose, what's Rose McGowan talking about? Or did they just get the lead? Rose McGowan made a tweet where she was talking about something and she was a bit of a crying, I think, right? Did it get deleted? No, it didn't. Sasha's still up there. Did she still up there? She got deleted. Okay, so I'm really sad and I'm really tired. I normally share thoughts, but tonight it's emotion. Just different, isn't it? We're just different humans, aren't we? Men and women, isn't it? Because I think I've said this before um, when it comes to like birthdays. I think because I've noticed it, I think maybe it might have been maybe a couple of years ago a few years ago i remember randomly stumbling across a feed and seeing a girl that i knew post a picture of like a champagne flute or prosecco and it's like oh happy birthday to me right like a little kind of cheers like, oh, happy birthday giving a like of the image and i just looked at it and it just looked really sad to me like it was just a you know a cheap flute on a white table somewhere in some council house where you're just taking a pic of yourself drinking trying to celebrate some trying to celebrate a day you know your birthday on your own and trying to make it seem like it's a fun occasion when you know deep down it isn't and that made me think okay cool i just think this is people are just different in the way they approach things because that's something i would never do right i would never toast myself like in a public arena like like a social media for instance i might silently to myself you know if it's my birthday crack a fucking drink open you know give myself a little pat on the back and go to bed but i'm not gonna you know do this weird because like, obviously it's a convoluted way to remind people that it's your birthday because once you do something like that people are gonna be like oh my god i forgot hey what happy birthday well done congratulations you still have another year but i just i, I don't know it just for me it's just like a, it's a bit of a cry for help right i think someone mentioned it i don't know who mentioned it but someone mentioned that you know there's there's a there's, there's a lack of selfies during the lockdown era because they seem like a desperate cry for help when you look in a person's eyes in the picture you just see emptiness right hopes and dreams dashed because of a fucking virus that originated from some undisclosed location in china so i get that but i don't know there's there's parts of me that i just can't understand this you know celebrating your birthday like give, wishing yourself happy birthday and people that post images of themselves crying or after they've cried like look how upset i am i was literally shaking it's a picture of them visibly shaken up shooken or whatever or whatever that term is it's like wow it's a lot and rose mcgowan did that she managed to capture perfectly her face just after she managed sobbing um looking out onto the sunset of her beautiful mansion but let's see what this whole issue is about i haven't actually read any of this but this is like i'm really sad i'm really tired i normally for share thoughts but tonight's emotion thank you normally it's thoughts but this time's emotion let's see what she has to say so this is a high res image of her post crying and a funny thing i actually saw her at a london jupe what platform that's here on i'm gonna say it was maybe might be london bridge or something i think when she used to live in london but you know we you know those things where you like you read about someone on the paper and you see them the next couple of days it's just those weird um 
serendipitous occasions and I must have saw her on a platform. One thing again, as most celebrities are, she's a lot shorter in real life, a lot, you know, we're a lot shorter with massive platform shoes. I remember seeing her thinking, oh, that's Rose McGowan, but I didn't want to, I had nothing interesting to say. But let's go. So that's a picture of her sitting on her deck chair, crying, or looked like she had been crying. And the next image says, yeah, I used to be a proud Democrat. I used to be proud American. I would have died for this damn country and its ideals. I was raised to be proud Democrat. When my youngest brother graduated as a fighter pilot at the Air Force Academy, I wore a vote Kerry, John Kerry pin, LOL. I got into a verbal education with big men who were mad I was a Democrat. All this stuff, okay, let's just read the whole thing. Uh, they were twice my size. I had listened to George W. Bush give the keynote address and John Ashcroft sing his terrible eagle song. I lost count of George W. Bush saying terrorism at 47 because that's what cult leaders do. It gets boring. All because I thought democracy meant I was had to be, I had to have right to choose who, those who lined up with the value system. But if it was, if there was no one, what? I don't know, just continue. And I was always told it was a Democratic Party that were the good guys, that our papers were New York Times, Washington Post, and we were, and we as a family love listening to All Things Considered, and we talk about how much we loved um, Ira Glass, the voice, but now I know too much, and I really, and I'm really quite, and I feel really quite a sense of loss. I really feel a sense of loss tonight. I'm not a cynical person, but American, God damn it, Republicans have always being painted as the bad guys and I've always seen them more as a cult but now I realise so are the Democrats in the media and the macro and the micro this is deeper and a cover up and I'm sad because there's a death around all the corners of shadows in the daytime and it hurts <sighs> imagine being a friend it must be so exhausting isn't it to be a friend of Rose McGowan like every social event turns into some kind of power some sort of discussion about power and politics and just it's just tiring like i'm tired of her complaining about shit now part of me is you know i'm also understanding that people just have interests like i can never understand people are just this devoted or disinterested in politics especially because for the most part even at her level of influence and her level of notoriety her level of fame her level of money um, i don't know cash in the bank she still can't influence a lot of things that she thinks she can influence, right? Politics is a game played way, way, way above anyone's head for the most part, right? It's a, it's a rigged game for most of the civilian class. If anything, you should be concentrating on, you know, how you live your life and then helping those around you and trying to do what you can as a private person to support the causes that mean the most to you. That's the most you can do. Worrying yourself about, you know the devils that lurk within the democratic party and the things that are at play it's just a complete waste of time because nothing's going to change it really isn't it's been like this for centuries if not you know if not longer um and i think if anything it's a real indication of just how entitled and self-absorbed some of these celebrities are that they come to the realization that oh my fame and my notoriety cannot change politics and cannot make the world a better place no it can't my love like that's what the that's what real life is like real life is shitty real life is plagued with disappointment and misery but we try and make the best of it somehow in the way the world is constructed we have created a group of people called celebrities who sub who kind of occupy the space where they kind of live outside of reality right if they want to you live in the hidden hills you go to your private events you go to uh, you have you know friends that everyone wants to be friends with and you hang around with the rich and the famous you can if you want to uh, re re withdraw from society and kind of live in this um, alternate universe where you don't really interact with the real world but when you step into the real world and you start trying to enact some sort of societal change uh, you start to get involved in politics and because you think your name can get you someone you get to slap in your face right as she did then you realize that quite clearly you can't it just feels a little bit it just feels a little bit disingenuous to then come and tell us as a public oh i've just realized that everyone is bad well duh why did you think because the uh, he or she wears a blue tie that they were suddenly going to be on your side politics is a self-serving industry everyone's trying to help everyone everyone's trying to help everyone else in order to make sure they can keep their seat keep their position uh keep their family name uh, a top of a door somewhere it's a rigged game why would you want to get involved anyway it's it's a whole bunch of virtue signaling for no gain whatsoever it just doesn't make any sense um and again like for all the stuff that she went through with me too and you know 
the the smearing of her name, the way she was treated in the media, Harvey Weinstein hiring people to fucking silence her. You would think she'd want to kind of step away and enjoy the fact that the person that caused her so much misery is now running in the prison cell somewhere covered in corona. But no, she's still trying to enact some kind of, be the voice of reason within the Democratic Party. It's like, come on, lay off of it, man. It's just, honestly, it's really exhausting. I think it must be the same for people that don't like sports if you hang around somebody that they're all all day every day talking about football it just must be like you just want to shoot stuff in the face it must be the same with the same with politics it just doesn't i never understand it especially people that are in hollywood they're so sheltered they're probably more sh- more so sheltered i guess than our celebrities in the uk in the uk i always feel as if like even the likes of Gemma collins they have to kind of weigh in on what's happening in politics right they ask her about brexit and shit but i think in the us for the most part you can get away with just being unproblematic and just silent as fuck and no one really bats an eyelid but in the uk you kind of have to say something even if it's a canned response it's something written by your press your 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 uh, publicist or your agent someone you have to say something about whatever issue is going on especially if you're somebody from a um if you're somebody from an ethnic minority you definitely have to say something you can't get away with just like existing but in america you can you can just exist and be rich and famous and beautiful and people just leave you alone um, but you constantly stick your head from underneath the parapet and you want to, hey guys, I've got an opinion about something, I want to talk. And then you wonder when people kind of have a visceral response against you and want to be like, get the fuck out of here, man. We don't need to tell them. You, you don't, I, want, I, I don't need Rose McGowan to tell me how shitty it is to work a minimum, pay, a minimum, uh, minimum wage job. It's like, I don't know, man. These people are insane. Man. They're really insane. But what do, what do I know? Anyway, that's Jackson and Zing Show, episode number 309. I'm going to end it there before it gets too late. As per usual, if it's the first time listening, please check out my website, xnozinger.com, for more information regarding myself. If it's your first time watching via the YouTube channel, of course, smash that like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If it's your first time listening via the podcast, leave me a five-star review and share with your friends. I'll be posting more episodes during the week. I'll try and do at least three during the week, you know, kind of keep the content going nice and slowly, but I will be ramping it up as we go on in lockdown. But again, if you want more information about myself, check me out on my website, xnozinger.com. You'll be able to find me on Instagram too, xnozinger, all one word, and on Twitter, xnozinger, all one word. Make sure you follow me on there, get in touch, and I'll see you guys and girls very, very soon. Take care. Bye. Peace, peace, peace.